Okay, here we are back from our break, and I, I'd like to touch base with the off-campus sites briefly. Is that Christopher? Are you here? I'm Jonathan. You're Jonathan. Okay. Jonathan, right. I had you mixed up with Christopher. Good, Jonathan. I'm glad you're here. Gary, are you still here? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Now, you too can ask questions as well as the normal class, and all you have to do is press your mic and, and, and ask questions. Uh, after the break, we now have our guests who have come to discuss the religion of Islam, of Islam with us. Uh, on my far left is uh, Issa Galloway, who is kind of in charge here, and he is, uh, has, has a, organized all of this. Uh, Jennifer Fisher is, is here, and in the middle is Suleiman al-Batli, who is an imam of the mosque, and they're, they're all going to give you a presentation and give you a chance to ask some questions. Okay, I'll turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. May God's peace be with you. Um, this uh, presentation kind of started as an extra credit for the crusade class last semester, and um, also because of the way Islam is often portrayed to the public, so we try to give you a first-hand view. Um, very honored to be amongst people of learning, you know, critical thinkers and people with open hearts, so thank you for your time. Uh, I have Jennifer, who's a recent, uh, we call revert, because we think that Islam is uh, just submission and that human nature is to submit to divine will, and uh, she's going to address some question and answer sessions and tell a little bit about her story. I have uh, on my immediate right here, Sheikh Suleiman. He's from Saudi with the Islamic Affairs and uh, very educated, and he's also a Qadi, which means a reciter of the Quran. Um, we always start everything with Islam, with our holy book, the Quran. So uh, Sheikh Suleiman is going to recite a book, a couple of ayats from the Quran, or verses that deal with uh, brotherhood and the way Islam brings people together. That was a focus in uh, Professor Vaughn's uh, presentation last semester about Islam being a united factor of such an international um, group of people. And uh, so this is the holy book of, <coughs> the, of our faith on that. Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be with you. Uh, at first, I would like to uh, thank uh, our professors and uh, my friends uh, Isa to introduce uh, me uh, for this meeting to introduce uh, our religion and our uh, cultures. Uh, I will uh, read some uh, ayat from holy uh, book. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا يسخر قوم من قوم عسى أن يكونوا خيرا منهم ولا نساء من نساء عسى يكن خيرا منهن ولا تلمزوا أنفسكم ولا تنابزوا بالألقاب بئس الاسم الفسوق بعد الإيمان ومن لم يتب فأولئك هم الظالمون يا أيها الذين آمنوا اجتنبوا كثيرا من الظن إن بعض الظن إثما ولا تجسسوا ولا يغتب بعضكم بعضا أيحب أحدكم أن يأكل لحم أخيه ميتا فكرهتموه واتقوا الله إن الله تواب رحيم يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله يتقاكم إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير. 
those were uh, ayats 11 through ayat uh, 13 in Surah Al-Hurat, which means the dwellings. And uh, the translation goes like this, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. O you who believe, let not a group scoff at another group. It may be that the latter are better than the former, nor let some women scoff at other women. It may be that the latter are better than the former, nor defame one another, nor insult one another by nicknames. How bad it is to insult one's brother after having faith, i.e. to call your Muslim brother a faithful believer, as O sinner or O wicked. And whoever, whosoever does not repent, they are such indeed the Zuliman are wrongdoers. O you who believe, avoid much suspicion. Indeed, some suspicions are sins, and spy, my, spy not, neither backbite one another. And one of you like to eat fish, to eat the flesh, would one of you like to eat the flesh of his dead brother? You would hate it, so hate backbiting. And fear Allah, verily Allah is the one who forgives and accepts repentance, most merciful. O mankind, we have created you from a male and from a female, and made you into nations and tribes, that you may know one another. Verily, the most honorable of you with Allah is that believer who has al-taqwa. He is one of the mutanameen, are the pious. Verily, Allah is all-knowing and all-aware. My, uh, my presentation today is going to focus on the Arabic language with some key phrases and terms from the Islamic religion. Um, Arabic is known to be a very rich language amongst the richest in the world. And uh, its relevance to the Crusades and today is that it did unite people from various cultural backgrounds. As, as you saw through Dr. Ivan's uh, um, presentation, it spread through China, throughout Spain. And one of the nice things, I walked in at the time when she was showing parts of uh, Al-Andalus, and that was a trip I just got back from, from with the university, actually. So it was, it was really touching. Um, the uh, first thing that we wanted to talk about in Islam, which is, cannot be stressed enough, is called Tawheed, and that means monotheism. It's very unique in that uh, Islamic monotheism is it's almost considered radical monotheism because God is only one. There's no partners or anything associated with them. Um, the first letter in the word Allah actually looks like the number one, and it's the letter for A in the, uh, in the, American, in the American alphabet or English alphabet. And to uh, further comment on uh, Tawheed, we want to again turn to the Qur'an and uh, read a surah, a very small one, that is called Purity, and it deals with Islamic monotheism. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad. The uh, transliteration, our translation goes like this. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Say, O Muhammad, he is Allah, the one. Allah Samad, Allah the self-sufficient master, whom all creatures need. He neither eats nor drinks. He begets not, nor was he begotten. And there is none co-equal or co-comparable unto him. And uh, now we're going to move directly into some terms from the Arabic language that are very significant in the religion. First, we'll look at the name of the religion, Islam. Islam is very unique in that it has one name for the followers, one name for the religion. I don't think there's another faith like that. A Muslim is one who follows Islam. The uh, roots to Islam are two words, one called salima, which means to submit, and the other called salima, which means to be safe. So the one who submits to God's will gets safety, everlasting. Um, the reason that I believe the follower of Islam has uh, a different name is that we view the, the religion of Islam as perfect and completed, where a person can never be perfect. So he's constantly submitting, constantly looking for repentance. Um, and again, the word Muslim has the same root, salima, to be safe. The next word, which deals with mankind, is called insan, which is the word, Arabic word for human, and it has two roots that are really interesting. Uh, the first root is called nasiha, and that is to forget. And it is combined with the other root, which is, has the, the conveyance of the word to be social. So the Islamic view of mankind is to one who forgets, yet has a need to become social. And uh, 
if you look at that, we always are kind of forgetting where we're going, what our purpose in life is, but we have this overwhelming need to commune with other people. Okay. The next word I have chosen would be salam, which equals peace, as in when we first started this uh, presentation, assalamu alaikum, um, is wishing peace of God upon you. Also, salam is the name of Allah, one of the characteristics. Then we move to salat, which is prayer. Again, similar uh, roots in all of these words, but um, peace through submission. When we submit, a uh, Muslim actually prostrates by putting his head and hands to the ground. And uh, that is like the ultimate submission to put your face down, to bow down to Allah. And through salat, you get peace through submission. It's one of the first, it's the actual first pillar of Islam. The next word on my list is zukat, zakat, which is uh, related to salat, and it is the word for charity. It's also another pillar of Islam, and zakat is a, uh, is a pillar, is a mandatory, that you pay a tax upon your wealth, something that you have saved, um, and to purify. And also, the root words of zakat is to purify your wealth, but also to increase. In the Islamic understanding, anytime you have wealth, the only wealth you have is what you've given, because that's what for the cause of God. So that's what you can keep with you because when you die, the wealth you've amassed leaves you. And uh, so when you give your, from your wealth, you purify it and then also that God will reward you with more. And then it has also the idea that um, plants, it, it's related to a word that has with, a pharmac with, a, with plants about um, growing or giving fruit. Now this is the controversial word we were talking about with jihad which literally means to struggle. And uh, commentaries of the Quran have said the highest level of jihad is the struggle internally, the struggle against yourself, to uh, keep yourself pious, to keep yourself from going to the lower things of this world. Um, another type of struggle would be, like for instance, to complete all the readings that Dr. Vaughn puts on you. <laughs> I know I was overwhelmed the last semester. Um, so anytime you're doing something that you're trying to improve yourself, it's a struggle, that's also a jihad. Um, it also has the connotation of holy war. That can't be denied and will, is actually not at all something that Muslims are ashamed of. Um, but what's funny is that in the media, they always say jihad when people are killed or people are massacred or things like this. The Quran, whenever it talks about killing or fighting, it uses a different word called kital, which is also on the list here. Um, the word jihad is never really associated with killing. It's always associated with the idea of struggling. Um, so moving on, there will be a time for question and answer, so if y'all need more clarification on any of these. Uh, the next word is called ishtihad, which is loosely translated to Islamic law, but you hear jihad at the end of that. Um, the linguistic meaning of it is uh, to struggle for the true interpretation. Um, it's the formation of Islamic law, which is happening about the time we're uh, talking about in, in the crusade class. Um, one of the interesting things about the Arabic language, and it happened also about this time, is that there's a book called The Tongue of the Arabs, and it's a lexicography of the Quran. It, every word in the Quran is preserved with its original meaning, um, basically within a hundred years of the time the Quran was revealed. So th even in like the University of Jerusalem, they use this book because it's closer to the time of ancient Hebrew than like the modern Hebrew has changed. So we look at like languages that have been prophetic languages. You have Hebrew, Aramaic, which is the language that uh, Jesus, peace be upon him, spoke, and then Arabic. You, I would encourage all of you to get on the internet and look at websites that show the um, script of all these languages. The Hebrew language script in handwriting and the Arabic language script, two letters are reversed in order, and that's the only difference really, and there's slightly different um, ways that the uh, calligraphy goes. And then the Aramaic script is directly in between those two. Um, the idea here is that God would choose languages that are the best language for uh, prophecy, the best way to talk to his people. Um, and those are the three languages that are consistent with Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Um, what, what we find is that, uh, from my perspective, the, uh, I know she spoke about this during the lecture because she told me she was, um, that we have a timeline of Judaism first, Christianity second, and Islam third. From the Muslim perspective, that's a little off. We consider all the prophets to be Muslims. So for us, Abraham was a Muslim. For us, Jesus was a Muslim. Peace be upon them. For us, Muhammad was the last prophet and the last example for us to follow. Um, 
what's interesting about that is the timeline for us is that Islam was from the beginning and now, but just completed when Muhammad's prophecy ended. And uh, again, we'll have question and answers if you have more questions on that. Uh, the next word to move into is called Sharia, which also loosely translated to Islamic law. The nice thing about this word is very beautiful. It literally, it means a watering hole, and it's normally used as a place where animals gather to drink. Um, it also has the connotation of the straight path. And it's the sum of the total of Islamic law, where there's another word that you'll hear in the media a lot called fiqh, which is also, again, loosely translated as Islamic law. But fiqh in a linguistic stance means to have true understanding. And then um, when you hear a lot of the uh, more uh, sensational speakers, a word comes up called munafik. Um, I made a mistake typing. I didn't, so on the list it's going to look a little different. Um, but the word munafik is literally a farmer, but what it means is hypocrite. And uh, if you think about what a farmer does, he puts seeds and covers them. So um, the idea that a hypocrite is one who conceals something or covers it, and then it grows. And this is why we chose the verses about brotherhood, do not backbite, do not talk bad about your brother, would you like to eat the, your brother's dead flesh? Um, in Islam, that's one of the worst things possible to do. Uh, the word that I had there originally was called kafirun, which means disbeliever, someone who went and apostatized from the faith. They're actually related. Um, in the beginning, I was talking about, I was happy to be around people who think critically and who have an open heart. One of the things that to me is very beautiful about Islam is the idea of the intellect. When the Quran talks about thinking and reasoning, it says they have hearts, but they do not use them. And every time the idea of thinking or intellect or rationalization comes, it's related, the word is used, the kolb, which is on the list, and that means the heart. Um, and what I want to stress here is that uh, if you get into a super rationalism, you, get, you can get confused when you don't have a feeling of, uh, of emotional intelligence, I guess would be the way I want to say it. Um, in Islam, the place of reason is in the heart, but not the heart that pumps blood, the heart that's related to the soul. The human body has uh, several components in the Islamic religion. Um, we're made from clay, just like in Christianity and Hebrew. Then we have the spirit of God breathed into us, called the ruh. And then you have the uh, intellect, which is related to the heart. And that is also related to the soul, which lasts after the body decays. Moving on, um, on the list, there's two words that are uh, very beautiful here. It's called amina and amina. Uh, interesting, these are, um, these are names that are commonly, they're words that are commonly turned into names. Amina means security, and then a derivative to the, of that is amina, which means a trust. And to, um, to clarify that, I just I could say that, like if I had my son and I went on a trip, I left him with his mother, she's, that's a trust I gave to his mother. So when I come back, she held him for me, or even something valuable, like a ring or something I could give to Suleiman, and he would return it to me when I come back. One of the, names, one of the reasons that's such a popular name is that we don't view that we owe anything, or we own anything in life that uh, our children are trust to us from God so that we have to take, for it, take care of them until they return to God. Um, the next word that I have listed is called toba, and that means repentance. Uh, the root of that is an idea of accepting and not giving. So that you make toba, then you're repenting to God for your mistakes. And then another root, another root word, which is to me very significant, is called al-hawa, which means desire. Literally, it means the lack of a law in your heart, that all desire comes from not knowing who your maker is and where you're going. So that when you have an emptiness in your heart, then you, you have desire. So when you fill your heart with what's true and what's lasting, your desires go away, and it's easier to handle, and then jihad is easier for you. Um, another word you'll hear very often is called wudu, um, which literally means to shine, and it's uh, spiritual purification or ablution. It's what a Muslim has to do before he can pray or turn to God. I know that when she talked about the pillars, and when I said Salat, the Muslim has to pray at least five times a day. Most people actually pray more, but the requirement is five times a day. Um, and then another word that's related to wudu is called nur. Um, wudu means to shine or glow. And the word nur, again, is a name of that people choose all the time. In fact, two of my best friends just had daughters, and they named them both nur and nora. Um, what that means is that their face gives off a light. Basically, they have that shine, they have a law in their heart, and then you see that in the brightness of their face. Uh, 
getting close to the end here. The last, one of the last words I picked was called taqwa, which literally has contrasting meanings, to fear and to love. But what taqwa means is piety. So if you fear Allah and you love Allah, then you have piety. And the Muslim is the one who tries to balance his love for Allah and his fear for Allah. And our idea that with monotheism and Tawheed, nothing can happen to you except for what's written, to, written for you by God. So you fear him in that when bad things happen, and then you also love him when good things happen. And uh, it's a contrast, and our whole life is to balance that contrast, and to have like a middle path. That's why um, it's very important today with all the uh, media hype and extreme visions of, uh, of Islam that is portrayed, that uh, really Islam is called the middle path. And we're supposed to be avoiding extremes on our whole life. Um, the last word, one of the last ones, is the Quran. Uh, literally, in the language, it means truth. Or it can be referred to as the Book of Allah. And then uh, the word deen here is uh, extremely important because the concept of deen means a complete way of life. It doesn't mean religion. Now, when Arabs talk, they talk about the deen of the Jews or the, the deen of the Christians. But what they're talking about is actually not just a religion that you do on Sunday, not just a part-time thing. <coughs> that everything you do in life is uh, part of your deen. So anytime you go to work, that's another word called ibadah, which means worship. Um, when you sleep even, you're resting your body so you can worship again. So deen can, is a totality, a way of life. So the word Islam would be the, the name of the religion or the name of the deen. Because everything we do is a part of our religion. And uh, there's a couple other words I don't have on the list, but um, being that she talked about Spain, <laughs> um, I got to see it vividly, and you saw some pictures of it when they showed a garden inside of a house. The word of, called dar, right, it's a concept which means seclusion. When you look at the gardens that she was showing before, it looks very splendid, but you don't get to see the outside. And the outside is walls built into each other, um, and there's a little tiny door that you go into. When the door is open, you just see a wall that's blank behind it. And then you go around that wall and you see the garden that you saw in the pictures that, with the fountain in the middle and very splendid. Um, the idea is that it's very common throughout the whole religion because like the way a Muslim is supposed to dress is supposed to be modest. You're not supposed to wear tight clothes. You're not supposed to show everything. But inside it can be splendid. Um, and then the last thing that I had, to, I had to talk about when she was showing those pictures of the architecture is a word called Hassan. Or, uh, which means literally to worship God as, you, as if you know God's watching you, to do things with excellence. Um, when you look at the architecture that she showed and you look at that type of thing, they had Hassan, they had an excellence that they were trying to achieve. And it was to, for the pleasure of Allah and also to inspire people. And here at this point, um, to kind of demonstrate the relationship of Islam with Christians and with Judaism, we were going to have Sheikh Suleiman recite Surah to Maryam, uh, the only chapter uh, in the Quran named after a woman, and uh, it deals with uh, Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, and his relationship with uh, his mother. A'udhu <laughs> billahi minash shaytanir rajeem واذكر في الكتاب مريم إذ انتبذت من أهلها مكانا شرقيا فاتخذت من دونهم حجابا فأرسلنا إليها روحنا فتمثل لها بشرا سويا قالت إني أعوذ بالرحمن منك إن كنت تقيا قال إنما أنا رسول ربك ليهب لك غلاما زكيا قالت أنا يكون لي غلام ولم يمسسني بشر ولم أك بغيا قال كذلك هو علي هين ولنجعله آية للناس ورحمة منا وكان أمرا مقضيا فحملته فانتبذت به مكانا قصيا فجاءها المخاض إلى جذع النخلة 
قالت يا ليتني مت قبل هذا وكنت نسيا منسيا فناداها من تحتها ألا تحزني قد جعل ربك تحتك سريا وهزي إليك بجذع النخلة تساقط عليك رطبا جنيا فكلي واشربي وقري عينا فإما ترين من البشر أحدا فقولي إني نذرت للرحمن صوما فلن أكلم اليوم إنسيا فأتت به قومها تحمله قالوا يا مريم لقد جئت شيئا فريا يا أخت هارون ما كان أبوك مرأ سوء وما كانت أمك بغيا فأشارت إليه قالوا كيف نكلم من كان في المهد صبيا قال إني عبد الله آتاني الكتاب وجعلني نبيا وجعلني مباركا أينما كنت وأوصاني بالصلاة والزكاة ما دمت حيا وبرا بوالدتي ولم يجعلني جبارا شقيا والسلام علي يوم ولدت ويوم أموت ويوم أبعث حيا ذلك عيسى بن مريم قول الحق الذي فيه يمترون ما كان لله أن يتخذ من ولد سبحانه إذا قضى أمرا فإنما يقول له كن فيكون وإن الله ربي وربكم فاعبدوه هذا صراط مستقيم All right, I'm going to offer the uh, translation. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And mention in the book, the Quran, O Muhammad, the story of Maryam, when she withdrew into seclusion from her family to a place facing the east. She placed a screen to screen herself from them. Then we sent to her our Ruh, the angel Gabriel, and he appeared before her in form of a man in all respects. She said, Verily, I seek refuge with the most gracious, Allah, from you, if you, fear, if you do fear Allah. The angel said, I am only a messenger from your Lord to announce to you the gift of a righteous son. She said, how can I have a son when no man has touched me, nor am I unchaste? He said, so it will be. Your Lord said, that is easy for me, Allah, and we wish to appoint him as a sign to mankind and a mercy from us, Allah, and it is a matter already decreed by Allah. So she conceived him, and she withdrew with him to a place to a far place, i.e. Bethlehem, a valley four to six miles from Jerusalem. And the pains of childbirth drove her to the trunk of a date palm tree. She said, would that I had died before this and had been forgotten and out of sight. Then the babe, Asa, Jesus, cried unto her from below her, saying, grieve not, your Lord has provided a water stream for you. And shake the trunk of a date palm towards you. It will let, a f it will let fall fresh ripe dates upon you. So eat and drink and be glad. And if you see any human being saying, Verily, I have vowed a fast unto the most gracious Allah, so I shall not speak to any human being this day. Then she brought him, the baby, to her people carrying him. They said, O oh Mary, indeed, you have brought a thing, a mighty thing. O oh sister, i.e. like that of Harun, Aaron, your father was not a man who, was, who used to commit adultery, nor was your mother an unchaste woman. Then she pointed to him. They said, How can we talk to the one who is a child in the cradle? He, Isa, Jesus, said, Verily, I am a slave of Allah. He has given me the scripture and made me a prophet. And he has made me blessed wherever I be, and has enjoined on me salat, prayer, and zakat as long as I live, and dutiful to my mother, and made me not arrogant, unblessed. And salam, peace, be upon me the day I was born, the day I die, and the day I shall be raised alive. Such is Isa, the son of Maryam, Mary. It is a statement of truth about which they dis doubt or dispute. 
It befits not the majesty, the ma majesty of Allah that he should beget a son. This refers to the slander of the Christians against Allah by saying that Isa is the son of Allah. Glorified and exalted be he above all that they associate with him. When he decrees a thing, he only says to it, be, and it is. Isa, Jesus said, and verily, Allah is my Lord and your Lord, so worship him alone. That is the straight path, Allah's religion of Islamic monotheism, which he did ordain for all of his prophets. Then the sects differed, i.e. the Christians about Isa. So woe unto the disbelievers, those who gave false witness by saying that Jesus is the son of Allah. From the meeting of a great day, i.e. the day of resurrection, they will be thrown in a blazing fire. How clearly they will, they will the polytheist disbelievers in the oneness of Allah see here the day when they will appear before us, but be the Zalimin, polytheist wrongdoers in pain and error. And uh, here we'd like to open for questions and answers. Oh, that's right. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> we have uh, Sheikh Suleiman and Jennifer. She's going to talk about how she came to Islam very recently. And uh, then Sheikh Suleiman would like to address you a little bit about um, Islam in America, actually. Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer, and I and just took Shahada, became Muslim on uh, March 29th, so I'm still very new and have a lot to learn, so if y'all have questions later on, I'll do my best to answer them, but keep in mind that I'm brand new. Um, prior to taking Shahada, I've been studying Islam for at least a year. I have a copy of the Quran and have been reading that and several other books, as well as talking to a number of Muslim brothers and sisters and hearing about their experiences. A number of them also um, reverts and, and also ones who have been brought up in Islam their whole lives. And um, in talking to them and in reading, comparing what I was reading to what I'd been raised with, I was raised Catholic, um, Islam just made a lot more sense to me, appealed to my logic, um, that there are not contradictions in the Quran and the teachings of Islam, whereas in other religions, I think that there are. Um, so that um, the feeling in my heart, as I came to know more and spoke with the brothers and sisters that I've met, um, led me, along with a lot of prayer also, to make the declaration of faith and take shahada a couple of months ago and since then I definitely think that I've made the right decision um, it's been a struggle since then um, to change habits that I had not that I was a bad person to begin with but there's a certain amount of discipline that you have to have to be a good Muslim. So that's been a struggle, but I think that it's been a struggle in the right direction. And, and so I'm very happy for that. Um, and after taking Shahada, it was just total feeling that a weight had been lifted off of my shoulders, off of my heart. And um, it, a, an experience of sisterhood and joy that I've never experienced before. Um, even with my experience as a uh, member of sorority when I was in college. So um, I encourage all of you to learn as much as you can and search your hearts and make prayer. And inshallah, you'll find the right path. Uh, actually, the most important in our religion in Islam, uh, uh, oneness of God, we believe there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, after the creation of Adam, just one original message has been repeated, has been repeatedly and delivered to mankind throughout the history of humanity. Thus, to remain people about it and bring them back on track. Many prophets and many messengers, including Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad were sent by the only one true God to confi to confi this message. What is this message? This message is the true God is only one. Worship him alone and keep his commandments. 
we believe only one God and oneness God and always Islam teach us depend on God and everything trust in God and everything and knowing in God also if we believe in this this is a reason to get happiness and to get rid uh, of sadness uh, for example if I want to study in university I will do my best I will study hard I will do everything but the first I have to trust in God deepen in God because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if God wants something it will happen nobody can prevent it if God uh, doesn't like something happen it couldn't be happen in the world in the uh, humankind in everything we always deepen in God even livelihood many people they face many problems in the to find uh, livelihood but if they trust in God the God can uh, help uh, them some people they don't believe in God who can do anything so if they listen or heard uh, bad news about their business some of them killed themselves uh, also uh, Islam uh, has many roles but the most important pillars of Islam are five pillars of Islam uh, the first thing uh, fifth which uh, call it Shahada there is no God uh, of uh, worthy of worship except God and the Muhammad uh, is his messenger his messenger this is first thing in Islam if you say there is no God but Allah and the Muhammad is messenger of Allah you will be Muslims and the second uh, things uh, or th the second pillars of Islam prayer Salat is the mean of the obligatory prayers which are performed five times a day five times a day and the uh, the time uh, are said at dawn noon mid afternoon sunset and night half five times a day each prayer uh, include or take contain five minutes only we thank God we pray God we ask God to forgive us to help us in our uh, life this is five times a day uh, each prayer uh, take just five minutes uh, the third uh, pillars of Islam uh, is uh, as zakat zakat it means charity to pay money to pay uh, from your money to poor people zakat mean uh, it mean uh, uh, pure affection and growth uh, growth and pure affection uh, if you pay money you will protect your business you will uh, increase your uh, business uh, each Muslims uh, has to pay two half percent from his money to poor people each year for example if you have uh, for example one thousand dollar in the bank and it's take one year it's still in the bank you still saving you didn't take you didn't uh, withdraw any one dollar next year you have to pay two half percent of this one thousand almost twenty five dollars for uh, people who in need or who uh, poor the fourth uh, pillar of Islam the fast fast uh, don't drink don't uh, eat uh, no uh, sexually relationship relation and fast from uh, down until uh, sundown from down from sunrise dawn. and uh, dawn. yes from dawn until sun uh, down uh, all, all day this is uh, just one month a year one month a year 30 days a year Ramadan we call Ramadan I think everyone heard uh, about the Ramadan uh, the five pillars of uh, Islam uh, pilgrim pilgrim we call it Hajj uh, visit Mecca for 10 days in a specific uh, time and every Muslims has to wear uh, two pieces of fabric and all Muslims 
uh, meet uh, each other from everywhere from everywhere from america from uh, egypt from africa from russia many muslims meet uh, each other like big uh, conference and they uh, make some uh, worship to god and uh, ask god forgiveness and uh, other uh, things uh, this is uh, feel muslims uh, all muslims uh, same no different if in rich people they wear uh, same uh, two pieces of fabric if in poor people they wear uh, two pieces of fabric uh, they pray uh, next to each other no uh, different between uh, them uh, that's five pillars of uh, Islam and we should use our mind we should think about why God created us what is the purpose of life there is a purpose of life or no what is your purpose of life if I ask each one what is your purpose of life if you said uh, my purpose of life, my target, uh, eat and uh, drink and get job and uh, uh, anything. No, this is purpose. Uh, animals eat, animals drink, animals sleep. But there is great purpose. There is uh, most important purpose, most target. The target, the purpose, which we believe in Islam, to worship God. This is very first purpose. God created us. God uh, gave us many things. Gave health. Gave eyes. Gave mouth. Uh, he make uh, us to uh, be able to speak to many things. The animals can't speak. The animals can't uh, think. But we can think. We can create something. God give us and we have to thank God. We have to uh, grateful God for this uh, thing by worship him uh, also uh, we have to think about is there any life after this life or no of course there is life after this life after death and we want to uh, prepare ourselves for the second life which forever this is not forever this is almost between 60 70 80 years and everyone uh, will meet uh, death, will pass away to other uh, life. Uh, and uh, my question, always think about yourself. Everything, uh, we make it for a purpose. Chair, uh, bin, bin is, there is a purpose to write. And the classes, we want to see, who can't see exactly. Car for transportation everything there is a purpose what is your uh, purpose why god uh, created you uh, the last thing i want to talk about islam in the world there are uh, many muslims in the world almost 1 billion 200 uh, million uh, and uh, islam become the fastest religion in america uh, i have many friends from america like isa like uh, jennifer other friends from Mexico, from Colombia, African America, they become uh, Muslims now. I have almost in Houston, maybe more than 25. They become Muslims uh, uh, five years ago, three years ago, six months ago. They become uh, Muslims. Islam, uh, I read the book uh, which uh, written by uh, American writer. He said, Islam is fastest uh, religion in uh, America and in uh, Europe. Uh, there are almost 8 million Muslims in America. There are almost uh, 4,000 uh, mosques. There are 500 Islamic schools uh, in America and uh, other places uh, also in South uh, America and Russia. Many people become uh, Muslims. Uh, this is uh, last message because the Muhammad is last message from uh, last messenger from God of course we believe in all messengers we believe in Adam we believe in Noah we believe in Jesus we believe in Muhammad but we believe the Muhammad last messengers and we should believe him we should follow uh, him uh, this is uh, my uh, talk 
uh, after that, if you have any questions, uh, we were ready to answer you. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I have a question for Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer, would you uh, describe your attire to us with the proper names and give us a history of your attire and what choices are available uh, in attire? The traditional head covering for women in Islam is called hijab. That's H-I-J-A-B. Um, Allah in the Quran has revealed to us that women should cover their hair and cover their necks. Um, so that and then this dress I bought secondhand, but women are supposed to cover their bodies to their wrists and to their ankles in loose fitting clothing. Um, so as not to reveal their themselves to the outside world, of course, when you're at home with your family, women can show their hair, let it down. I guess wear shorts if they wanted to, so long as people uh, who are not part of the immediate family are not around. And, and when women are amongst other women, then those restrictions are also released because this is primarily to um, keep women um, safe from men's looks. I'm sure all the women in this room have experienced some sort of harassment related to their own appearance from men, um, cat calls and the like. So just to protect from that. Um, as far as the history of it, I, I don't know enough yet to really speak to that. But as far as I know, this is from the beginning when the Quran was re revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Women have been covering since then. Does that answer the question? Pretty much? Okay. Um, if I could make some comments on that. Uh, one thing about Islam is it's very multicultural. So if you meet a Muslim in Nigeria, his clothes is going to be completely different than a Muslim from Saudi Arabia, or from Saudi. And uh, then you meet a Muslim in China, and he's going to look like a Chinese person, maybe with the, one of the Muslim hats on. I mean, as long as the clothes covers and is loose fitting, that's the idea. It's not about a particular dress from a particular country or anything like that. Um, some people feel the need to dress like people from Saudi Arabia, um, but again, as long as the requirements are met on modesty, it doesn't matter. I mean, I had a dilemma if I was going to wear something traditional here or, I mean, my mom's Mexican, so I chose to wear a guayabeta and <laughs> just because it's me. Um, <laughs> but I could have came in the thobe or the, um, the real traditional that you see on TV all the time and look a little bit like Osama or something. But um, <laughs> I chose because I'm American, I'm from here, I want to look like an American and try to take away the foreignness or that aspect. Can, can I just expand a little further on the, the same question? Does the male have the option to choose to wear anything he would like to choose as opposed to the female not having that option? Yes, of course. She has optional to choose any wear, any dress, any colors. But she has to uh, cover her head, she has to cover her whole body, without, of course, hand and without face. But she has optional to choose any uh, dress, any, uh, also his husband. Her husband, she, uh, uh, she can choose it by herself. Nobody can, uh, you must, this your husband, you must choose this husband, you must wear this uh, uh, dress. No, she can choose by herself. Also, um, the, uh, in the Quran it talks about a husband and wife as garments for each other. The one, like a garment being that they protect you, they protect you from the outside weather. So your husband is your garment, your wife is your garment. And the relationship is very sacred. So um, it's the idea of not sharing that relationship with the whole world. And uh, again, one thing um, that's really funny is that as I became Muslim, everybody's like, oh, you have to pray five times a day. Oh, you have to do that. You have to do that. Um, Islam is much more about what's allowable than what's not allowed. Um, when you look at the rules in an overall picture, it's very much the little bit's forbidden and so much is open. Um, like, in, for instance, with uh, the sisters in Islam, nothing that they earn, the husband has any right to. Any job that they can, they, all their money is theirs. 
yet everything that the husband earns, there's a right to the sister on it. Um, and it just goes on and on. Uh, anyway, I'd like to open more questions. If, that's a sati if anybody is not satisfied, we'll continue. Um, I was going to ask um, if, um, if there are any differences between, uh, in the dietary laws between uh, the Judaism and the Islam, if there, if there are any differences at all. If so, what are they, if you know? Um, my experience with that is that uh, the Bible has the exact same, being Old Testament, as the, uh, the, the laws that are in there, except for the New Testament, would be identical with Islam. Um, in fact, Muslims can eat what's called people of the book, uh, Aleph Kitab. That's the name of honor given to the people of the three faiths. Uh, so if I go to a kosher restaurant, I have no problem eating anything in there. Um, if I went, my personal opinion, if I go to like a Christian-owned restaurant, in America, I don't think that they may follow the exact rules that like the Jewish people still follow it. So I would prefer to go to like a kosher place than not. Um, but dietary restrictions would just be the same. No pork. Uh, Muslims don't have any alcohol of any sort or intoxicants. But um, other than that, as long as there's no intoxicants or pork, and that it's the animal if it's slaughtered in the name of God, because we don't believe you can take life without the permission or invocation of God. Yes, sir. I have two questions. One, you just talked about the dietary law, so it kind of brought up on one. I know in the Jewish culture, the meat and the milk are separated. Right. Is it also followed in Islam? And also, you pray five times a day. I just wondered if there was any significance on the, on five, why there's five times, not three or not four, but what the significance of that is. It's the Sheikh knows much better than me, so. <laughs> why uh, why uh, pray uh, five times a day? Uh, the pray and the in the dawn, dawn, we call the, uh, the sunrise, uh, prayer. sunrise, because the sunrise and uh, the darkness finish and the start a day. This is sign of God, the change uh, from darkness until day. This is sign of God, and we should pray for this sign of God. This is great something. Uh, also, the second pray. Because the sun remove and the sky it's remove from from, the from, from east until west, and the uh, fourth pray because the dark become start, it's finish day, and the uh, dark uh, start and the, this is sun of God. Also the last pray uh, because the half uh, night uh, the red moon it become uh, red. All of them sign, signs, uh, signs uh, of God and why we pray five times a day. When uh, Professor Vaughn was talking about, mm. what was it, 50% of the stars had Arabic names, Islam has a very rich culture of uh, astrology. Also, um, the prayers are spaced out. Astronomy. Astronomy, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> the prayers are spaced out throughout the day, almost strategically. I mean, you wake up first thing in the morning at sunrise and you remember God. Then at high noon, you remember God. Then when the sun starts to go down into moving towards the night, you stop. That's the busiest part of the day. At about 5 o'clock-ish, everybody's rushing in the freeway. For us, that's the time to stop and remember God. It's, it actually is the most weighty prayer because you're tested because you're so busy at that time. Then there's the sunset prayer, and that's again a sign going from lightness back to darkness. You remember God. And then before you sleep, half of the night, you remember God. And um, there is... Actually, it started uh, <laughs> the story about how it became five times. Um, was it 20 that was first uh, was told to Muhammad? Uh, the, first the, the first commandment from God was to tell the people 50 times a day. Uh, there's almost a negotiation between our prophet and God. Uh, <laughs> the command was to tell the people to pray 50 times a day. And this is a story where Muhammad went to heaven and met the other prophets. And uh, he came back from his speaking with God that he was like, 50 times, people can't do this. And it was, um, it was Abraham, actually, who said, ask him for, for something easier. And it comes down, <laughs> he goes back and forth, and it comes down to five times. But then God tells him, we'll reward you if you pray it 50 times. Yeah. So it's a mercy um, that each prayer is, is weighted that much. And then uh, something to be really clear about is that the sun is the timing of the day, of, of the days when you pray, but 
um, specifically times you can't pray, like when the sun is actually setting, <laughs> when the, the colors are in the sky, until it, you can only pray once the sun is not visible. And the reason for that is that we don't get confused um, with people who would like worship the sun. Or we want to distinguish, we want to preserve our monotheism. So it's always at times when it's like not at the, the, the zenith, but at just after. And then not while the sun is rising, but just before. Uh, Can I make a comment on that? I mean, it's almost exactly like the monks pray in the monastery. Yes. Yeah. Actually, I mean, it, it's, it's almost exactly the same pattern that the monks use yeah. in Christianity. Mm -hmm. Also, the, the prayer is a link, link between you and between uh, God. Some people ask why I uh, have to pray. For example, if someone uh, you are you uh, you uh, for example you are in the road, in dangerous road or in the dark, uh, no gas station, nobody can help you, and your car uh, break down, and someone come and help you, and give you gas and uh, give you food, give you some money, and of course you will say thank you very much, I appreciate for your help. And uh, you will try to repay his help in the future. And the God gives you many things. God gives you many things. And it's, uh, at least we should think him five times. Uh, and uh, each uh, times five minutes we think him for his what he uh, gives. He gives uh, everything in the life. Animals, he makes it for us. Trees. Uh, and many things he gave uh, for us, we should thank him for that. In Dr. Vaughan's lecture, she said that service to the state and service to the faith were identical, and that the church was synonymous with the state uh, in original Islam. And I was wondering, but she actually went so far as to say that the Sharia, where she lived in Malaysia, there were police to enforce the moral laws. And my question is, how do Muslims in America adapt to the culture here where that's not the case? There's um, also, it's not widely known, but a Muslim in another country has to conform to the law of that country or go back to a Muslim country. So for us, like, we may not like things that our government's doing, but we have to pay our taxes because we live here. So a Muslim is supposed to be one who's law-abiding. We're not uh, vigilantes are you know, going against the grain. We shouldn't be, <laughs> anyways. Um, so basically, if we choose to live here, um, then we follow the, land, the rules of the land. And uh, it's considered the reason to live in, in a non-Muslim country would be to uh, spread your faith. So that is also kind of an incumbency upon Muslims, to share what we have with everyone. Does that answer the question, I hope? I'd like to follow up. Okay. Because I was wondering about the same thing. Um, um, obviously, in following the Koran, a Muslim would prefer to live in a Muslim state that is ruled by uh, the religion. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Correct. And, and so, um, how, how do you adapt to living in, in, in other countries? And I guess I'm sort of also tying that into... Um, for example, the situation in India right now in Kashmir, where uh, most of the inhabitants of Kashmir, or at least the Kashmir part ruled by India, are in fact Muslim, and um, uh, India has sovereignty over it, and Pakistan obviously, uh, well, I, I won't say that they have claims on it, although they are making a claim, but, but um, uh, how would you comment on that situation as looking at the Koran as, as the guide to life? Uh, actually, uh, uh, as the professor said, uh, Muslims uh, prefer uh, for him to live in uh, Islamic uh, states. And, but it's allowed to live uh, in, in another uh, countries, other countries. Uh, uh, which uh, country is not follow uh, Islamic rule. Uh, if you uh, came for uh, study, for knowledge, you can come to other countries. Here many Muslim students came to uh, seek uh, getting knowledge. Uh, also, if you came to uh, treatment, if you are sick and you don't find uh, treatment in your country, you can come 
to another countries. Uh, also, if you uh, came to uh, help or support uh, people who in need, it's allowed for you. Uh, and if you don't find job in your country, don't find a livelihood in your country, you can uh, move to another country to find a job or uh, getting a livelihood. Uh, I know um, many uh, people uh, have uh, misunderstand and misconception about Islam. They think uh, Islam uh, support uh, terrorism, uh, Islam want to kill other peoples. No, this is uh, against Islam. Islam means peace, peace with other, respect other people. Let's see what the Quran said. The Quran said, God forbids you not with regard to those who fight you not for faith, nor drive you out of your homes from dealing kindly and justly with them. For God loves those who are just. Love other people who are just. And in the war, uh, the war, if you want uh, its uh, defense, defense yourself, it's you can uh, war, especially holy war. But we, you can't uh, attack other peoples without any reason. Of course, if they come to your country, if they come to your house, you can defense uh, in your uh, self and in your uh, countries. Okay. Um, if I could add to that a little bit um, about the idea of justice. Uh, there's actually, did you talk about hadith as in the lecture already? Hadith? I mentioned hadith. Yes. Okay, that's the collections of the life of the Prophet, his sayings mm -hmm. and his actions. In a hadith, he says that Allah will grant victory to a non-Muslim country over a Muslim country if the non-Muslim country is more just than the Muslim country. So um, the idea is that so I know Muslims that come from countries that feel that life in that country is very unjust so that they come to America where they feel they can practice their Islam better, being that the Constitution allows freedom of religion and protects that. Cool. Um, so a lot of people come here because they feel that they're better Muslims here, because they feel restricted in, in so-called Muslim countries. And uh, I really like to stress any time I talk to anyone, the idea of the difference between the word Islam and the word Muslim. So many times things are called Islamic values or Islamic uh, organizations or institutions where it may just very well be a Muslim institution, like uh, saying that in Malaysia, I think you said you could not go into the, into the mosques, correct? Because uh, you were a non-Muslim. Because as a non-Muslim, right. I could not go into the mosques. I, yes. no. I would very much call that a Muslim institution, not an Islamic yeah. one. We want to bring everyone to the mosque as much as possible. Oh. Yeah. Um, well, what about, what about women in, in, in this country? Are women allowed in the main part of the mosque, or are they segregated into the back part as they were in Malaysia? Yeah. Everywhere, Everywhere, they're on their own section. What's nice about um, Morocco, I just came back, the third biggest mosque in the world, they did something very beautiful. They, uh, it holds 70,000 people. And what they did was they put elevated levels on top of the men for the women. So they were on just a higher level with the view directly down. The idea is that if I'm praying and there's a woman right in front of me, the way we pray, we bend over, we put our head down. <laughs> you're, not, you're not praying to God anymore, you're looking at something. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, or if, you know, women normally are the ones with the children, not always. It's actually many stories about the prophet giving a kukbah or a sermon where his son came up to him. He hugged his son during the middle of his sermon, put him back down and let him go. But um, ch children by nature want to be with the mom. So if you have the women in the front and the children, it, it, creates a, it can create a problem for everyone trying to pray. The idea is more of like a logistic, maybe just uh, what's better for everyone. And um, I really like what they did in Morocco, that they put the women on top so that there's no idea of behind. But um, as far as segregated, in the days of the Prophet, the sisters were just directly behind the men. They weren't ever like in a different room with a wall closed. That's very much a modern thing when it happens. Can you just speak to that for a minute? When I first learned about that, that made me really angry. Like, well, women are as good as men, why do women have to be in the back, and so on and so forth. And actually, it's a testament to the strength of women, that women being behind men will not be distracted from their prayer, that they're able to 
you know, block that out and focus on God like they're supposed to, whereas men, if the women were in front or in the same row with them, would not be paying attention to the imam in front trying to give a lesson or on their prayers. So um, that's something that, like I said, I think testifies to the strength of women and being able to pay attention and things like that. So. So in, in countries that we, you know, that we've been seeing on the news, women are in the burqa and they talk about women being, you know, beaten in the streets because they went out, you know, doing whatever in the company of a man who wasn't their husband. Do you, I mean, Muslims like yourselves, do you consider Muslim laws like that to be, you know, good or bad or indifferent? Or is that, I mean, is that something that you just think that's just a cultural difference? Or does that... Is that something bad in your religion? Any mistreatment of any person would be considered wrong, regardless of if they're Muslim or not. Um, when you were learning about, when she was displaying Spain, uh, I think she showed a picture of 12 lions in, in the Alhambra, the, the palace. And that was a gift from the Jewish community to their Muslim rulers because of the fair treatment that was in Al-Andalusia. The Jewish community was so treated well that they gave this gift to the palace of the capital of Islam. And it's a phenomenal gift. Back in the 1300s, it would shoot water out every hour on the hour. There was 12 of them. Each lion would shoot water twice. It was a clock, but a fountain. It was very incredible. Uh, the engineer recently tried to figure out how it worked and broke it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's uh, um, kind of a testimony to the science. But um, as far as these uh, rules that come up in each country, again, when Islam, the Muslim lands were, col were colonized in, uh, and in the post-colonial age, there was basically a, a degradation of what's called the alums, or the scholars. There used to be a council of scholars that would kind of, like the, the um, basically Organization of Islamic Affairs, which he belongs to, but there was one general for the entire Muslim world under the Turkish Empire. When that left, you have a lot of people with different opinions, you have people with their own agendas, using religious rhetoric to try to support what they want, not necessarily what the Quran teaches. And uh, we're much in a rebuilding phase right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you said you you have seen pictures of, of the women don't wear burqa. They a, hate them. Afghanistan. In yeah, I, I think it was actually in a magazine. It wasn't on TV. There was a woman mm -hmm. who went in, like undercover. You know, um, not undercover, but she went in and just so she could speak okay. with women because you know a, a male reporter wouldn't I go think, into the women's space. Uh, and talk to them. I don't. Uh, she, I. I, I I, I don't say, I don't like say this uh, picture of uh, fabric, fabric, do you know fabric? Oh, fabrication. Fabrication pictures, maybe, but I don't sure. Uh, also, we, if we want to know Islam, we have to take Islam. We have to touch, uh, study Islam from there, from his sources. There is sources for Islam's Quran and what Muhammad Prophet said about Islam. Don't take Islam from uh, countries, Islamic countries, or from uh, Muslims people. No, this is uh, not true. Take Islam and study Islam from his sources. Quran and Muhammad Sallallahu what did he, did he say? This is true. Well, I have a question then about the Sharia, which is something that always bothered me in Malaysia, that um, um, what we would consider not necessarily crimes but sins uh, like adultery, women being stoned for adultery. Uh, uh, for example, there's been in the news um, two women, one in Nigeria and I forget where the other one was, uh, both of them <coughs> were raped and they were condemned in courts for adultery uh, because they had children and uh, uh, their word was, was just ignored. Uh, and and they were condemned to being stoned to death. Yeah. Now that's part of the Sharia, yeah, yeah. as I this understand is, it. This is, of course, this is part of Sharia. Ah. If women uh, made, uh, if she women, if she uh, married, if she is uh, ma married, married uh, and made uh, adultery, uh, Sharia ah, stone her, but with hard conditions. With hard conditions, should be for witness see her when she make uh, uh, the adultery, 
she can't just be seen by four they yes. have to see penetration Sh there four should people. be four people we are witness she made a tall tree and uh, if you can explain uh, and there are many hard conditions if one of the witnesses if, yeah uh, testimony is different than the other ones mm -hmm. all the witnesses are punished yeah or again backbiting is yeah so but, but, but in these two cases the child was considered the proof the fact that the woman's husband was in prison or, or away no, no, and that no. she had a child if you look when she like should in have African countries where there's yeah. these type of things happening anyway like yeah. in India you have people burning themselves <coughs> when their husband dies and honor killing <coughs> yeah. that was pre-islamic that was there before and a lot of times there's these things that last um, again you have to go to the source unfortunately a lot of us have lost our source and uh, that's just there's yeah. a difference between culture, again, between Muslims, the ones who try to follow, and then Islam in its, in its purity. In the, in the past, uh, two people, uh, they uh, witness about women. We saw her uh, do uh, so and so. And when the Khalifa, King Muslims, uh, bring them, and uh, he heard different talk about them, then he uh, banished them because they want to tell her about the women is uh, incorrect something. Then he bash, banish all of them. Yes, there are hard uh, conditions before stone women. There's also a and story that's yeah. very appropriate with yeah. this. It's one of the hadiths of the Prophet. A woman who actually went to him, admitted that she committed adultery and that she was with child. She wanted to be stoned to death to get her punishment in this world instead of the next world. He told her, go raise your child. She came back after the child was born. She wanted to be punished again. He told her, wait till your child reaches a certain age. Her child reached that certain age. She came back again, trying to get the punishment because she was afraid of the punishment of the next world. And she said, make sure your child has someone to, to raise them. Then she came back. Then they gave her the stoning because she wanted it. She didn't ask for a trial or anything else. And then one of the companions of the prophet said, may God curse her. And then the prophet said, no, if any one of you had half of the repentance and sincerity she did, this whole town would be forgiven. Exactly. So um, th this is a very appropriate hadith of, of the Prophet. And it's, if a man had the same thing, the punishment is there as well. Adultery is adultery regardless of the sex. Do you have a question? Okay. Yeah, could you push him yeah, actually I wanted to ask if a man, man commits adultery and he's married to like two or three women and he goes, you know, with somebody else, will he get stoned if he meets the criteria of four women, four witnesses or, you know, Women and men have equal punishment before the law and equal reward before the law in Islam. Yes, ma'am. Well, my question was a follow-up really to Dr. Vaughn's because I think I read the same articles. It was my understanding that the women she, were, she was talking about were raped. We're not talking yes. about adultery here. We're talking about rape. And when she reported the rape, then she was found guilty of a crime. Right. There, there's, there's the, that has happened in Pakistan. It's happened in a lot of places. But again, these are, these are cultural things that have left themselves, their imprint. And they're not, people try to use uh, religious rhetoric to support things that they want. Like in, in a Muslim country, if you don't feed your family, nobody will do business with you. There's the big thing about honor. Like if you're a deadbeat father, you can't go anywhere without everybody knowing and nobody will deal with you. So you're stuck. If uh, your family has a daughter who's considered violated, then it's a cultural thing where they feel dishonored. They would actually encourage their daughter to try to save the family's honor to do an honor killing. And that this is all before Islam. This is things that are still there that Islam tries to get rid of. Just like the um, infesticide of uh, female babies in pre-Islamic Arabia. Uh, it was a very big practice. If you had a daughter, it was considered a burden upon you. And they would actually bury their babies alive. Um, also, something that came as a result when Islam forbid that, the dowry went backwards. It used to be that the father of the daughter would pay the man for taking the daughter. Now the male uh, husband who wants to get married pays the woman a dowry. So it reversed and elevated the status of women. I believe you had a question. Thank you. Um, I just want your opinion about um, what do you think drives this, um, the, terror, the terrorists that claim to believe in Islam um, to kill people? Is it that they interpret the Quran in their own way or why do you think that happens that you know that they claim to be to believe in Islam and they do all these horrible things that's a very uh, big question <laughs> to look into someone's heart is uh, incredible big issue uh, 
I would imagine um, if I was living in a country where, for instance, they're bombing, and I look up and I see USA on the plane, I would have some animosity towards America. I mean, that's just me. <laughs> I don't know about you guys. Um, even if it's not the Americans doing it. But you would think, man, this country, they're so powerful, why are they bombing us? At the same time, um, people are programmed like crazy. Uh, a story about Muhammad Ali, the boxer, really seems appropriate right now. Right after September 11th, he went to Ground Zero, and a reporter asked him and said, how does it feel to be of the same faith that these people are? And he responded, how does it feel to be the same faith as Hitler? There's fanatics everywhere around the world, and people whose hearts are sealed and don't act correctly. When he looked back, the reporter was gone. And uh, I think that just kind of explains people can be misguided at any time, no matter who they are. Uh, a couple more questions. We're running out uh, of time. We're, we're about out of time. We have a minute and 23 seconds. Uh, I would like to show this paper here. It okay. offers free uh, information on Islam, and we have handouts for everyone. And uh, I will give anyone my website or email address that if they have more information they need. Okay. We thank you very much for coming. This was a very enlightening uh, conversation, and I think we all learned quite a lot about Islam. I know I did. Okay. And we appreciate you coming very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. It was our thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.